I'm making a video game. Last time, we broke down the steps to create a level from scratch and discussed the benefits of watching Bob Ross. Those two things were somehow related. We left at the point where the level needed polishing and some very in-depth tweaking, so we'd better get on with that. Let's talk game design. It probably goes without saying, but if you haven't watched the previous devlog, then you should go and do that now. Really, you ought to watch all seven. It's fine, Mandalorian Season 2 is finished now, so you've got nothing else to watch anyway. Come back when you're all caught up. I'll wait. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed them, and welcome to the wonderful world of waiting a month at a time for me to upload a new one. We've got some very important things to do, but first... This isn't housekeeping in the usual sense, because what we need to do is level related, but has nothing to do with level design. What we've done, and I say we so it can't just be my fault, is forget to put in our instant death pits, for which we use the Crayola spike. So let's slap those in. I've mentioned this before, but their sole purpose is to offer an instant death fail state if the player falls down a hole, which obviously they shouldn't be doing. It's a very simple, blunt force kind of mechanic with a singular purpose, but it does also tie in neatly to the next thing we need to talk about, as we start to polish and finish up our level. In case you ever come into these videos thinking, man, this guy really knows a lot of things, then let me assure you I had to look at whether illusionary was even a word, because I was worried I'd made it up. Thankfully it is, so I guess carry on thinking I'm smart. Illusionary difficulty is where mechanical level design joins with visual design to create a tangible and usually predictable response in the player. We're now into the parts where we're messing with the player's emotions, which is really addictive if you're an egotistical sociopath, and I'll be honest with you, there's worse things for a game designer to be. Look at this area here. As it stands, it's pretty neat and tidy, very efficient, good flow, nice little segment, very good. But is it as rewarding as it could be? What we're doing in this section, if you remember, is signposting the player with our spike bar and wall spikes, so that we can confirm they understand understand how springs and wall jumps work. If we want to reinforce that even further, we might do something like this. I'm sure you can see the difference visually, but if you're playing the level, there isn't really any difference at all. Going back to the perfect player philosophy, this entire segment has a pretty clear, obvious and suggested ideal path. You can, if you want, double jump off the spring and avoid the wall jump, but this is actually harder than just going through the intended path, and it doesn't gain you anything, so it's unlikely that people will bother. The player would have to go really out of their way to hit these hazards, but that's not why they're there. Instead, we're focused focusing on intimidation. Level hazards, generally speaking, look intimidating, especially in Reiterate, where they're all made of devious pointy spikes at harsh angles. Intimidation is part of the psychological accompaniment to creating challenge, which we'll get into more when we talk about difficulty. Imagine if you got on the bus, and the driver smiles at you and says, £2.60 please, thanks, and gives you a cheery wave. You'd stand there, rifle through your pockets because you're an idiot who didn't get their money ready before the bus arrived, hand it over, and off you go. Now imagine you get on the bus and the driver is frowning at you, and in a big, booming voice says, £2.60, like Gandalf yelling at the Balrog. Then he proceeds to stare at you with icy cold eyes like he wants to punt you through a nearby tree, and for some reason his eyes are also bright red. Many people will find it significantly harder to get their coins out and sorted under that kind of pressure, even though the action they're taking is exactly the same. The action seems more difficult than it is because now you're intimidated, and that's what we're doing here. We're not actually increasing the challenge in a meaningful way, we haven't put any extra hazards in the player's intended path, but because it looks worse than it is, the player hopefully feels like it's a more difficult set piece. This is level 18 in World 1 of Super Meat Boy. World 1 is obviously the easiest of all the worlds in the game. Here's the intended path through the level. See how easy it is? But look at how complicated, daunting and full of hazards the level appears to be. Super Meat Boy, especially in the earlier worlds, is full of stuff like this. It uses illusionary difficulty to get you used to the idea that later on, it is actually going to be as difficult as it looks. But it's not just intimidation that we're looking for, because this brings with it a sense of artificial accomplishment. It stands to reason that if you make something look more difficult than it is, then when the player completes it, they're going to feel more accomplished than they maybe should. Remember how in this segment we're trying to reinforce their understanding of springs and wall jumps? Using illusionary difficulty, we make them feel like they've made a greater accomplishment than we're actually challenging them with, and that will give them more confidence in using those mechanics we were just trying to teach them. The moral of the story is, messing with people's heads is fun. Now, you don't want to go overboard with this. Some indie games that I won't name because that would be mean, fill every available space on the screen with hazards until it looks something like this. I don't need to give you names because if you play a lot of this genre you'll know at least one of them. There are a few problems with doing this but the main one is that you're paradoxically making your level even easier. Remember when we put in this spike bar and we talked about signposting, basically advising the player you're not going that way? If you fill up all of your available space with hazards, you're effectively telling the player you're not going in any of these places whatsoever at all. Follow this path, 
don't deviate, it's fine. Like the intro to Undertale, where you get walked through a spike puzzle. I mean, sure, it might look intimidating at first, but where are you gonna go from there? Here, visual hazard placement is a rising, ascending, cumulative, one-time deal. Once you've ramped up how difficult your level looks, you can't take it back again, and it's going to get ridiculous. What's worse is that, like those horror games that just bombard you with jump scares, boo. Eventually, it'll stop having any effect at all. It'll just be the way that levels look, and your player will become numb to the influence altogether. And we certainly don't want that because, as previously discussed, we're all egotistical sociopaths and we like messing with people's heads. So you need to be careful with your illusionary difficulty, and the degree you go up to will depend entirely on what you're making. But as a general rule of thumb, if there are more of what we might call fake hazards in your level than there are real ones, you might be tipping the scales towards too much. Another drawback to taking it too far is that, as you can see, it takes up so much screen real estate. And as we all know, I worked very, very hard on the background art and all of its visual effects, so I'd like the player to be able to appreciate them, which brings us nicely on to... We've already covered how level design lets you control people's brains in a borderline sociopathic way, which is lovely. But what about letting you bend and shape the very fabric of reality itself at your every whim like a god? That might be slightly dramatic. What controlling the space is all about is controlling the space. But controlling it to do what? Well, this is best demonstrated rather than explained. In our level, we're moving to the right. We've already covered why we're moving to the right, but have you noticed that we're also moving ever so gradually upwards? Now remember that this is an early level, maybe even level two, so we're not going overboard with our paths and design yet. But even at this early stage, we can start to take the player on a journey thanks to controlling the space. Upward momentum, even as gradual as this, creates a sense of accomplishment. And since we're still teaching the player the mechanics of the game, we want to build layers of accomplishment over everything we do. That's why we played with illusionary difficulty after all. You'll also notice we have a lovely wide open space above our player, where we can appreciate the full breadth of that incredibly gorgeous parallax scrolling. Open spaces serve a few purposes in platformers, but the main one we're after here is to lessen the overall sense of pressure. Like I said, this is an early level, and we're still trying to ease the player into the game. It's like having a lovely stroll through a park on a warm summer's day, which as an English person, I have almost never experienced, because the sky hasn't stopped being grey since that one particularly hot day in August 2004. And if you're thinking, no, Zane, you're making this up now, it's just a big open gap, it's not that deep, then oh, sweet summer child from August 2004, let me demonstrate. Here's Yoshi's Island, a game that I consider, brace for a hot take, the second best 2D Mario game ever made after Super Mario Bros. 3. Yoshi's Island is a masterclass in visual and level design harmoniously coming together to manipulate the player's emotions. It starts off in one of the most pleasant settings for a game that I think I've ever seen, with bright, vibrant colours, thick, cartoony outlines, adorable enemies, and a lot of wide open space above you. You'll feel like you could go all the way up into the sky if only Yoshi's little feet flapping hover move, that I used to think was him trying to fart for extra height, <laughs> could take you there. But not long after that, you'll descend literally into a cave level. The underground cave levels have low octave music that I won't play because Nintendo's gone a bit takedown happy lately and I'd rather not risk it. A darker aesthetic, usually a visible ceiling, and paths that get narrower and narrower as you move down them. This is controlling the space. What you're doing isn't really any different in either scenario because it's too early in the game for the low ceiling to be hindering your movement in any meaningful way. But they will both feel different as a result of the aesthetic and level-based design choices. Something like this is integral to the idea of creating drama in your levels and building up their individual narrative. Every level has some kind of narrative to it, and as a designer you can either consciously piece that together or let it happen naturally. Both are valid approaches, but it will happen whether you're involved or not. As an example, think of the original Super Mario Brothers. No, we're not doing level 1, relax. We're doing World 1 level 4, which is the first of Bowser's castles. For starters, you'll see as you go through the level that the space is controlled with lower ceilings and even though the hardware can't really do too much vertical scrolling, a general, gradual trend downwards thanks to starting off at a higher point in the screen. Add that to the introduction of lava and some original hazards, and we're gradually increasing pressure and intensity even in something as simple as a 2D platformer. Then the fireballs start, because everything changed when the Fire Nation attacked. You make your way through these off-screen fireballs and oh my, how unpredictable. It's Bowser, standing on a bridge over a lake of fire. Now, to many of you, this isn't going to seem all that dramatic. You've been here before and you've done far more impressive things over the years. But back in 1985, this was a big deal, I assume. I don't know, because I was minus two years old, but you can see how this sort of ramping up in dramatic action is effective, even in something as basic as the original 
original Super Mario. Now we've sort of done this already. You can see how the level starts with a big blank space and a single spike bar, then goes on to our player teaching moment with a spring and a wall jump, then even more open space, and how the individual challenges in the level are meaningfully spread out until you reach the end, where we've got a spike bar into a spring, into a wall jump, into a double spike bar, into the goal, with the Crayola spikes hammering away underneath and a sprinkling of illusionary difficulty around the place, and a smaller gap to almost squeeze through just for added pressure. The narrative of this level could best be described as the ballad of the spike bar, and will inevitably be getting a Netflix exclusive movie adaptation starring Adam Sandler as a spike. As we ran through all that you might have been thinking, alright, I get the use of space, but why are there so many gaps with nothing in them? Well that's because they are actually... Think back to high school, or for those of you still in high school, think back to, I don't know, yesterday? Did you ever have a scenario, possibly towards the end of the year, where you had to sit two exams in the same day? I did. I did the same thing in college, and weirdly the same thing in university, and it never got any less unpleasant. Side note, if you're wondering why this child is smiling, it's because he knows he's failed already, and he's currently filling his exam paper with lewd sketches of his favourite anime girl instead. Stay in school, kids. Now there were, thankfully, breaks in between those exams. I'd use mine to sneak off to the library, and finally open up the book I was meant to have read six months ago, so I could write an essay in two hours about the underlying meaning of a contents page, and how the curtains are never just blue. But imagine if you had those exams without the break. Please fill the comments below with your school experience, because I'm convinced the only people who say school is the best years of your life are people who basically peaked there. Anyway, the idea of the big blank spaces is a rest period. They usually come after a challenge where you've asked the player to prove they know how to do something. So literally a test. Like I've mentioned, this episode is focused on messing with the player's emotions, and we've been using challenge to ramp up the player's intimidation and pressure, so if we're doing that, we also have to let them cool down again. This is actually part of how horror design works, or more frequently doesn't work, and goes back to the idea that if you overdo something in horror, it's going to rapidly lose its effectiveness on the audience. One of my favourite horror games of all time is Eternal Darkness, a game that spends less time trying to scare you outright, and a lot more time engaging your analytical brain, trying to distract you with its adventure game-like puzzles, an intriguing celestial horror plot spanning a thousand years. This means when they do want to scare you, usually with a brilliantly innovative sanity effect, you're not always expecting it because your brain is engaged elsewhere. A lot of the dime a dozen horror games you'll find on Steam focus primarily on scaring you, and as backwards as this sounds, they shouldn't. They don't give you anything meaningful to engage in, focusing instead on some arbitrary reason to walk around a forest at night so something can jump out at you from behind a tree or whatever. That'll work once, it'll most likely work twice, and it might work three times, but past a certain point it's going to stop affecting you at all, and these games sink into obscurity because they don't leave any lasting impressions. Pulling the player's focus in one direction for too long without a break can be detrimental to their overall experience with the game, and in a nutshell, that's what rest periods are for. I have to wrap all of this up by telling you that for as much waffling as I've just done about level design, you'll notice that everything I've just talked about and everything we covered in the last video happens in the space of about 20 seconds. They're things the player most likely won't even notice, at least not consciously. I may one day do a video on the nebulous and stupidly named topic of game feel, about how two games can be so similar in appearance, design and intention, yet one of them just feels wrong. And the level of thought that you put into seemingly unconscious player interaction plays a big part of that. I could, if I felt like it just slap everything into a level just because and hit a hundred levels in the space of a week but I wouldn't feel comfortable trying to sell that to people and like I said at the very start of the devlog series the point is to put out something I feel proud of you might notice that I didn't have to actually change much about this level because I already sort of designed with this stuff in mind as I go and now I'd consider it pretty polished just to reiterate all of this can and most likely will change once playtesting starts but if there's anything you think I'm missing at this point please do put it in the comments below so I can pretend it was my idea the entire time. Next time we'll look at difficulty, how we design and balance it both in individual levels and in the game overall, and I might try and go the entire video without mentioning Dark Souls. If you liked this video then make sure you like this video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.